Good evening and a warm welcome to all of you out there watching us this evening for the, with this webinar in partnership with AOT and Legs Matter. Um, it's an honour to be here this evening uh, and to, to sort of ch uh, chair this session. Um, my name is Joanne Casey. I'm a podiatrist and professional development lead at the Royal College of Podiatry and I'm co-chair of Legs Matter with my colleague Alison Hopkins. Um, tonight we've got this uh, webinar on um, oxygen therapy in wound care and I've got two delightful guests with me here this evening. I've got Jane Bobby, who's a senior diabetes podiatrist and a lecturer at Birmingham Metropolitan University and I've got the global expert in diabetes, Professor Andrew Bolton, who's a professor of medicine and diabetes at the University of Miami. And we're lucky enough to still have him here in the UK tonight because I hear he's jetting off over across the pond uh, later off this week. So thank you both for being here this evening to be part of our um, our webinar with Legs Matter and AOT. How are you both doing? Are you all right? Very good, thank you. Lovely, great, thank you. So this evening's webinar, we're going to be concentrating on topical oxygen therapy and the importance um, of using the advanced wound care therapies in diabetic foot ulceration. Um, it's the all around uh, raising the alarm on harm, as you know from our awareness week, that's our focus. So this, the focus is the theme of the hidden harm crisis on leg and foot care and how we can support patients in their journey um, in, you know, in prevention and um, reducing the, uh, the complications attached with diabetes and foot ulceration. So we're going to be focusing on the hidden harm crisis in the diabetic foot ulcer management and how the use of oxygen therapy um, is used in wound care to support and uh, improve patient outcomes. Um, one of the, uh, we've got, because this uh, the hidden harm crisis is our theme for the Legs Matter Week, um, and what we've got with Legs Matter is a sort of strategic kind of uh, concept where we look at early intervention, safe administration, and then we look at complex disease. And so tonight's going to be looking really at the safe administration, but also the complex disease section of our strategy. Um, and that brings us into our 10 point plan. So everything we do here at Legs Matter comes back into our 10 point plan. So if you haven't seen our 10 point plan, um, there'll be uh, more than uh, would think that our um, Sue and Kerry in the background there will pop a link on the screen for you. Go and have a look because what we're going to be doing in this webinar is considering aspects around four of our 10 point plan. So number four will be making sure every patient has access to evidence based practice. Number five is increasing access to the right product at the right time. Um, number seven, address knowledge and skills gaps. And number eight, how do we change the system? So that's what we're trying to really sort of bring over in our 10 point plan and our strategy here at Legs Matter. And part of this in partnership with the AOT is to be looking at topical oxygen therapy. Um, I'm going to start this evening by asking Jane, who's from FD UK. So this is a, they're sort of bringing this uh, webinar um, together with Legs Matter and, and AOT. Uh, so Jane, um, I've got a slideshow, I think. I'm going to just try and share my screen with you. Um, Hopefully. And uh, let's see if I can do this correctly. So whilst uh, whilst Joe's just doing that, I'll just uh, say thank you to Legs Matter and to AOT for inviting FD UK to, um, to take part in this panel discussion this evening. Um, as Joe said, my name is Jane Robbie. I'm a senior podiatrist and a senior lecturer in Birmingham, um, and I'm co-chair of um, the Foot in Diabetes UK, known as FD UK. So just for any of you who don't know what FD UK is, we're an organisation that's supporting healthcare professionals who are delivering um, high quality, clinically effective care to in, improve the outcome and lives for people um, living with diabetes foot problems. Um, so if I can have the next slide, please, Joe. So that very much kind of resonates with the Legs Matter 10 point plan and, uh, and um, action on harms. But what do we do? You know, our priorities are around shaping national strategy and influencing public health representing diabetes foot care with visible communication, supporting learning and education through, um, through our own um, uh, sort of uh, platform, but also by contributing to events such as this. Um, and also leadership development by, by supporting the workforce and developing across the whole workforce um, leadership um, through, through, um, through the diabetes foot uh, network. And we do that by visible communication and again you know taking part in webinars and uh, at conferences and um, uh, information sharing events uh, supporting learning and education and again that all resonates again with this leadership development so i'd like to um, i'd like to start uh, by saying that you know this webinar is is uh, vital to uh, diabetes foot wound care 
um, because it's showcasing innovative um, patient-centered treatments uh, aimed at promoting early wound healing. And that's kind of what we're all what we're all here to do. And I hope that everyone who um, is able to be here tonight is encouraged to explore the effectiveness of topical uh, oxygen therapy and the benefit um, to the multidisciplinary team management of diabetic foot wounds. Um, so could we just have the next slide, please, Joe. So I'd just like to introduce um, a, an initiative that uh, came out of the Ideal Diabetes Group and uh, has been uh, showcased widely through FD UK. And this is ACT Now, and you may, you may have heard of it. It's been widely published and presented nationally. And ACT Now is an acronym. It's de designed to be um, a one-stop shop for people with um, foot problems to know when to seek early intervention. Um, the acronym was devised by this multi-professional team but also with the input of a person with diabetes. And it re represents the A is for an accident or trauma. C is for any change, if you just keep um, pressing forward, uh, Joe, they should come up. Um, C oh, is sorry. any change in, um, in shape or color. T is any change in temperature. Uh, N is new pain. O is any oozing or exudate. And W is any wound. And that comes up to this, uh, contributes to this, um, this notion of ACT NOW. And ACT NOW is a call to arms. It basically means that if you have any one of these six uh, uh, sort of issues, you should act now. You should do something about it. Seek help. See, see a professional who will tell you whether that foot needs um, specialist intervention from the diabetes team or whether you can manage it quite safely at home. And again, that, that uh, contributes to the Legs Matter 10-point plan and the reduction of harm uh, by promoting early urgent care, reducing delays in access specialist services and uh, empowering patients to uh, look after their own um, foot and leg health. If you'd like to go forward again, Jo, that would be great. And so just to, um, just to round off my little section at the beginning, um, just to support um, the... Uh, the consideration of the, the use of topical oxygen therapy. Um, the IWGDF um, published their guidance uh, last year and in their guidance was this recommendation 13 and you can read uh, that quite neatly off the slide uh, that supports the, um, the use of topical oxygen therapy as an adjunct to standard wound care. And we should be aware that also NICE and the National Wound Care Strategy have published uh, good practice pathways and guidance that also support um, uh, optimum wound healing. And, and these can be all accessed from their, their individual websites. And we should be reminded that um, uh, uh, diabetes foot care and uh, optimizing um, wound care is, is part of a pathway. And that includes principles of offloading the foot. We want to get the pressure off those, uh, those vulnerable areas. We want to look at antimicrobial control and antimicrobial stewardship. We need to address medical management and that includes disease management around diabetes uh, um, optimization and, uh, and also the management of comorbidity. We need to be addressing any vascular or surgical intervention and that includes any orthopedic reconstruction or the input of um, uh, plastics teams. Education and support is vital for both healthcare professionals, patients and carers. And we need to be uh, thinking widely around dressing selection. And that includes these advanced wound care therapies, including things like lava therapy and also topical oxygen uh, interventions. Um, and that's been, uh, as I say, highlighted here um, in this IGWDF uh, uh, recommendation 13. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to uh, Professor Bolton, who's going to take you through and contextualise all of this with the prevalence and incidence of diabetes foot ulceration. Professor Bolton. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. While I'm sharing screen, I should clarify that I mainly work in Manchester. Now, I was full time at the University of Miami for some years, uh, even back in 1983, as a young assistant professor with black hair. But now I'm there occasionally, so this is a, a good week to go. So good evening from Chile, but actually sunny for a change, Manchester. Uh, and I'm going to try and share the screen now. Yeah, so, that's. There we go. And go to slideshow. So 
have been asked uh, to talk about, really to start with, what about the global problem of diabetes? And until the end of, uh, or the beginning of last year, I was president of the IDF, and I should hasten to say that it's not the Israeli Defense Force. Uh, this is the International Diabetes Federation. Uh, and one of the tasks of the IDF is a global patient organization and physicians and healthcare professionals is to produce an atlas every two or three or four years. And this is the really authoritative source for the evidence of the prevalence of diabetes across the world. The last one was produced uh, and published in December 2021. And the frightening uh, figures here are that one in 10 people across the world has diabetes, one in 10. The biggest increase in the next decade or so uh, is going to be in the most challenging area, that's sub-Saharan Africa. And it's frightening if you look at the increase of diabetes across the world uh, between 2019, the previous atlas, and the last one, 2021, a 16% increase in the prevalence of diabetes across the world. And it's calculated by our epidemiological friends who run the Atlas, that nearly 7 million people died in 2021 due to diabetes and its complications. That's more than 10% of deaths from all causes. So we're facing an epidemic of unprecedented magnitude. Uh, you'll have to excuse my voice because I've got a bit of a cold having just been lecturing over the weekend at the Central European Diabetes Meeting in Italy, where the weather was a lot better than here. And coming back to this cold, damp Manchester has not been very good for my health, but I was seeing patients all day anyway. So the estimated number of people with diabetes in the world in 2021, over half a billion. Now, this is an underestimate. There's no doubt about it. And the increase is going to be even higher the rate of increase is going to be higher. And I reckon that probably by 2045, 2050, there'll be 1 billion people. This is a gross underestimate. Our next Atlas will be coming out at the next World Diabetes Federation meeting, and that's going to be in Bangkok. It's been postponed for a year. And that's going to be uh, in April of next year. So the Atlas committee is actually meeting uh, next weekend at the American Diabetes Association. But despite, uh, this is, work from uh, my good friend Ed Gregg, who's one of the top epidemiologists from the Centers of Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. But now he works at Imperial in London and in Dublin. And he has pointed out we must not be complacent because in the first decade of this uh, century, we were seeing a reduction in amputations and diabetes, but this has been reversed in 2010 to 2015 with an increase again that's been seen. It's not only in the United States, in many countries, and other diabetic complications are increasing too. These are data from Marianne Kerr, who you may know, who is a health economist, who really is an expert in diabetic foot problems, and we've been working with her recently. And this is the most recent paper looking at costs of diabetic foot care in the UK, 2019. This is just in NHS England. The cost for the year 2014 to 2015 was nearly 1.25 billion pounds or dollars. This is in dollars for a global audience. A 1% of the NHS budget goes for diabetic foot care. And remarkably, 90% of this is not for hospitalization, for outpatient, uh, this is an American, ambulatory care, uh, which is outpatient and community expenditure. So diabetic foot care accounts for more expenditure than the combined costs of lung, prostate, and breast cancer. Here's from our review that uh, we published, and David Armstrong, many of you will know, professor of podiatry and surgery, University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, he was, did his PhD with me in Manchester in, at the end of the last century, in the 1990s. Uh, and we wrote this review in JAMA, published uh, uh, a few months ago, showing that diabetic foot ulcers in 2023, there are increasing worldwide. Globally, there are probably more than 6 million ulcers annually, and approximately 50% of these will become infected. And of those that become infected, 20% will be hospitalized. And of those that are hospitalized, one in five 
may well undergo some form of amputation. These data are horrendous, but we can do much about it. Primary prevention, secondary, tertiary, whatever. Primary prevention, if you've got diabetes, let's screen for risk and prevent the ulcer from occurring. Secondary, if you've had an ulcer, let's prevent a further one, etc. So we could say that diabetic foot care has been the pits. Uh, and in America, the pits means it ain't too good. But we can use these letters to talk about what we should be doing, prevention, identification, treatment, and service. And we're going to be talking about treatment in the second half of this, uh, this evening. Now, one person that influenced me most uh, was Dr. Paul Brand. And he worked in leprosy and later in diabetes in the Christian Medical Center in Valor. And he became a world expert and a delightful person, a missionary, a surgeon who did so much to help people with leprosy and diabetic foot problems. And this is a historic picture from one of uh, Larry Harkless, a well-known podiatrist in the United States. He used to run an annual meeting in San Antonio in the winter in December. And this was in the late 1980s. There are well-known people on here, Dr. William Wagner, you've probably heard of the Wagner wound classification system. Uh, and he was professor of uh, orthopedic surgery at Rancho Los Amigas, Los Amigas in, Los, in California. And he worked with uh, Megit from Cambridge and they put this Wagner classification together, which we still use. This is the late Roger Pecorero uh, next to him. And he uh, described pathways to amputation and diabetes very clearly together with Gail Riber, epidemiologist. Marv Levin here, Levin and O'Neill, the first ever global textbook on diabetic foot. And here is Dr. Paul Brand, a delightful person who I was so honored to meet firstly 40 years ago in, in India, in Ch Chennai, who was then Madras, and learned a lot from him. And we all follow his guidelines, whether we know it or not. And the person on the left is me 40 years ago, so that shows you the dangers of working in the diabetic foot. <laughs> so he said these words, and nothing could be true, and we forget this. Pain is God's greatest gift to mankind. And, you know, in my foot clinic, a, a registrar will say to me, look at that patient. It's so stupid. They've got a huge hole under their foot, and they're walking on it. I said, no, no, no. The patient's not stupid. You are. You don't know what it is to lose the gift of pain that protects us all from injury. And that's one of the main problems we find it difficult to grasp. And he described Brand that the warm but insensate foot is the at-risk foot in diabetes. And he was right. We went on to prove that in prospective studies that he asked me to do. Simple clinical observation, he taught us all. Any patient with a plantar ulcer who walks into your clinic without limping must have neuropathy. If you've got a hole in your foot, it should hurt. If you've got neuropathy, it's fine. You can come in smiling and you have the same foot ulcer if you've still got a foot years later. And he wrote these words. When I started to see diabetic ulcers, it reminded me of leprosy. So these are not diabetic or leprosy ulcers, they're trophic ulcers caused by loss of the gift of pain and some form of injury, whether it's pressure or walking on hot sand, as I see in Miami, I see patients burning their feet. And we see holiday foot here. Uh, and I'm sure that, that, that um, Joanne, who used to work at King's, saw this. Uh, people coming back from hot climates with ulcers on their feet caused by just simply not wearing protective footwear on hot sand or hot, you know, hot right sand, here. hot cool. swimming pools, flip flops. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so these are data from my good friend David Armstrong, who did his PhD with me, as I said. Look at the outlook. This is the five year mortality of diabetic foot complications comparing with cancer. Foot ulcers, the five, foot, foot, five year mortality is worse than breast cancer. And for Charcot foot, the same. If you've got a minor amputation, it's worse than all cancers put together. If you've got chronic, chronic uh, can, what was it called, life threatening ischemia, limb threatening ischemia, it used to be CT, CLI, chronic limb ischemia, but now it's chronic life limb threatening ischemia, or a major amputation, it's even worse. Only lung, lung cancer has a worse outlook. So this is a very serious condition. So, how are we going to prevent it? So, I'll try and be provocative to bring some discussion. Is diabetes the cancer of the 21st century? Well, screening for high risk groups is effective. You know, people who are overweight, 
or the family history of diabetes, gestational diabetes, and so on. Long-term remission is, and even cures are possible. You've heard of uh, Roy Taylor's uh, 800 calorie diet, which can reverse type two diabetes. It's possible in cancer. Increased public awareness has been effective. People are frightened of it. Now, I'm not suggesting that fear arousal is a good technique. And um, clinical psychologists would sort of have a knife in my back if I said that. But we need to consider what happens. Because if you think about it, why does someone go and have a mammography or a PSA test? Because they're frightened of cancer. In heart disease, why does someone take a statin? They don't feel any better because they're frightened of heart disease. So what about diabetes? Well, let me give you this case history. Man in his 60s has a routine screening, found to have a high PSA. Transnet perineal biopsy, prostate cancer, locally aggressive, but no metastases. Undergoes hormonal therapy, brachytherapy, external radiotherapy, outlook cure expected. What's the response? Oh my goodness, you've got cancer, that's terrible. I can't believe you've got cancer. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's me. That was me six years ago. And I'm still here. Uh, not doing too badly. This could have been me. Routine screening found to have glucose in the urine. Further test, type 2 diabetes. Examination, perhaps a bit of loss of sensation, a bit of protein in the urine. Diabetes treated with medications. No cure, significantly increased mortality risk and reduce life expectancy because of the neuropathy in the proteinuria. What's the response? Oh, don't worry about it. It's only a touch of sugar. My mother had it. My grandmother had it. She lived till her 90s. So perhaps we need to think how better, um, Diabetes UK or Lim, Limbs Matter, how better to raise awareness of the risks of diabetes that might be prevented by good screening uh, and just regular health checks. This was a patient writing in the Sunday Times. Some of you may have seen this. And in the supplement in uh, early 2019, before the pandemic, a patient with diabetes, he said, well, cancer is serious. I thought heart disease was serious, but diabetes didn't feel serious at all. And now I've only got one leg. His outlook is worse than those with cancer or heart disease. But it's too late at this stage. So we need to move back and see what we can do. So I'll end this first part and perhaps Time for a bit of discussion before I talk about treatments. This is Edward Wilson wrote these words. You teach me and I forget. You show me and I remember, so perhaps slides are slightly more useful, but you involve me and I understand. So it's giving patient empowerment. We have new techniques of you know, smart technology to measure foot temperatures, to inform the patient. We published a paper, I've got that as an extra slide if you're interested about how smart insoles may raise awareness and cause patients to alter gait as the pressure gets too high in the shoe. So the future is interesting and promising, but only if people adopt these new techniques. And we should be thinking about how better to prevent foot problems. And the second half, I'll leave a blank here now in case you want to have discussion now. It's up to you, uh, uh, ladies. If you yeah, want to okay. That's, that. It's quite... Um daunting, scary, to sort of see those figures and numbers and those projections really just sort of, it's overwhelming because when you think about what we're dealing with already, and then that has the potential to deteriorate this burden of disease that we're going to see, I think is is just going to be, a, we need to find a mechanism and a way in which we can look at prevention or pits. We need to be thinking about how we can look to try and prevent this deterioration. And I, it's, one of the things actually someone said to me once is where when does the diabetic foot become at risk jane andrew when do you think it starts the the at risk foot is it from diagnosis is it from risk <laughs> identification? I'll, I'll speak first. i don't think it is from diagnosis but uh, we were part of the united kingdom prospective diabetes study in type 2 diabetes and in that study 13 percent of people at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes have neuropathy of sufficient severity to put them at risk of foot ulceration. So in type 2 diabetes, they can present with late complications because it's been missed, they haven't been screened. So it has to start from diagnosis. But I think if someone's got a healthy foot, 
they can live a, a normal life. We don't want to tell a young person with type one diabetes, you know, is, is no neuropathy and no vascular disease, you can't walk barefoot on the beach. They'll, they'll say, or oh, stuff that, you know, uh, and I, I'm not going to take my insulin either. And that would be a disaster. So I think we need to be very careful. You, we should spend the time educating those people who are a proven risk and the annual review will detect, detect those people. Mm. Do you do you do you agree, Jamie? We were just yes, chatting. I think, I, sorry, I think I I think I agree. I think you know there are a lot of people from diagnosis who are who are at risk because they have you know poor understanding of their diabetes. They have maybe poor health seeking um, seeking behaviours. Maybe they you know maybe they're not engaged with their health quite as much as we, we might want them to be. And I think that put that has to put people at risk. I think if you you know it's it's about empowering people with with the the knowledge that they need at the time that they that the time is right for them, um, because we can give any amount of information at diagnosis, but but we know that people at diagnosis go into information overload. They're told about their diet, they're told about their diabetes control, they're told about their eyes, their kidneys, their feet, and things you know things like their feet kind of slip off the radar if they're yeah. not a problem at the time. I think, you know, Act Now has proven that, that you know, giving people, um, you know, a simple toolkit to, to know when they have a problem, to know where to go, to signpost them to, to see to, to the people who can help them at the, at, you know, at the time that they that, that, that they, they need an intervention, you know, have, have positive benefits. I think educating people around what is what is the ideal um, and, and, you know, whilst Professor Bolton says, you know, for some people, we're not going to stop them walking barefoot on the beach, but for some people, we might stop them walking barefoot in the garden, or we might stop them, um, you know, weight bearing on a on an on an ulcerating area, you know, a, a pre ulcerative area or an ulcerated area. We might stop them getting in the bath with a with a dressing on. Those sorts of things where we can make, you know, there's there's those small wins, and mm -hmm. I think any foot has the potential to be at risk. You know, any any foot, it's it's really simple. I, and, and I did it myself this week. You know, it's it, the, the weather got a bit warmer. I got a new pair of shoes out. I put a new <laughs> pair of shoes on. I went out for the day. It was all very lovely. I came back with a very nice blister. Thank you very much. Now, for me, with no neuropathy, I could feel that. And I can I can, you know, make make the intervention at the time by going and buying some plasters and sticking something on my heel. If you have neuropathy, you don't know that. You don't have that gift of pain. You don't know that you've got a problem. So I think, you know, there, there is always the, the potential for, for any foot to be at risk um, mm. with or without um, uh, diabetes, with or without neuropathy. But I think, you know, educating people, empowering them, you know, giving them information about where to go to, to seek help, educating those healthcare professionals that, that look after them to, to know where they can go to seek help. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully then we can keep those those potentially at risk feet in, in, in that low risk category for longer. Um, and we hopefully keep them away from the, the high risk um, sort of um, scenarios that uh, that we all deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, that's that's right. I think that that kind of um, empowering the patient, providing them with the information and education that they that they require at the time that they would like to receive it, all fits into that personalized care agenda, that shared decision making approach. Whereas healthcare clinicians, we can inform and guide, you know, guide as needed. That what matters to you, how can we help you? So it's 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 important, I think, to identify the risk, uh, yeah. and inform, you know, as the patient is, you know, as, as the patient would like, you know, at the time and supporting them in their journey, really, with what matters to them at the time and how we can best best help them. It's um. And I think you know, there was a comment made earlier, Joe, uh, in in a meeting we were in earlier, where somebody was talking about you know it's important for for patients to know what their own risk status is. So you know, Professor Bolton mentioned about annual screening, and we screen people's feet, but we don't always tell the patient whether they're low risk, at risk, or high risk. And I think again, for for, for patients, it would be helpful for them to know that, so that it's not a surprise when we tell them that in clinic. Or it's not a, you know they're they're able to to you know, make some lifestyle changes that can that can um, have a positive benefit for them and reduce their risk of harm. I think one of the problems is that um, there is no proof that actually education reduces foot ulcers and never will be. No, no trial. But no. as my wife, Dr. Loretta Vinikita, 
she's worked as an MD and a PhD in psychology, looking at patients' understanding. And people can't conceive that neuropathy exists. They think it's a vascular problem because the foot is warm, so it must be okay. But it must be something to do with the blood flow because that's, they know blood flow problems come to the leg. And you know, patients say, well, it's a vascular problem. Uh, there's nothing to do with feeling because my foot f- feet feel fine. So I think we need to use you know, an example, like a, a light bulb will go out if the wire to it is cut. And that's exactly what's happened to you. The wire can carrying that information to your brain has been cut. And simple use of words that patients can understand, I think really helps in education, even though we'll never prove that it works, but we all know underneath that we have to give it. <laughs> it's, um, no, I agree. And I think it's, um, there is something around the shared decision-making approach and how we can try and support our patients best. and. I th- you know, more studies, more trials in education would be would be great. But as you say, it's, it can be quite difficult to do on volume. Um, so, Andrew, you've, you've introduced us to the what's the problem, the scale of it, diabetes, the, you know, what uh, the prevalence is. And, you know, ultimately, we need we need help. Don't we? we need to be thinking about what we can do with wound care right. to support patients living with diabetic foot ulcer. So. Tell us a little bit more about oxygen therapy and its okay. management in, in wound care. So I think most people would agree that a diabetic foot ulcer should heal if there is adequate arterial inflow, if we aggressively and appropriately manage infection. And recent studies have shown that IV antibiotics, for example, are no better than oral in osteomyelitis, a big national study in the New England Journal of Medicine from Oxford. But most important is to remove pressure. Uh, as Jane already mentioned, and we're least good at that because people don't understand the patient will walk on it. So it's offloading that matters most. This is standard of care. <coughs> so treatment of the ulcer itself, the debridement, it's what you take off that matters more than what you put on, take off the dead skin, take off the callus, remove pressure, taking off pressure by offloading and treating infection. Now, if that's standard of care, if that does not work, then there are others we can use. And here's uh, my headman's wrote this very nice editorial in the Lancet Diabetes and Neurology in 2018. And he said there's been a renaissance in diabetic foot care. At last, we're beginning to see good randomized controlled trials that show us that some treatments work. Uh, because before that, if you look at the studies of, for example, skin substitutes in the ni- 1990s, they didn't take into account offloading and wouldn't, the companies couldn't understand the patient would walk on an ulcer. You could put $2,000 worth of artificial skin on the foot. If you walk on it, it's dead, gone. So we, and William Jacko, Frank Game, and others put a, a series of papers out uh, looking at what, how should we design trials in the diabetic foot, taking into account confounding variables, randomization, appropriate inclusion, exclusion criteria. And now there have been a number of well-designed randomized controlled trials that are beginning to show actually some treatments do have efficacy in a well-designed trial. First example I'll give you is of sucrose octosulfate, which you probably know is ergostar. Now this is a large uh, RCT, randomized controlled trial of sucrose octosulfate or ergostar in neuro ischemic ulcers, led by Mike Edmonds, but it was across Europe. So it's a large multinational randomized controlled trial in the Explorer study. And they randomized patients with neuro ischemic ulcers 20 weeks of sucrose oxysulfate or standard dressing and the healing was faster without any side effects so here's a well-designed trial that showed efficacy one of the first another one is the loco patch or 3c patch that fran game led up that was in the same issue of the lancet diabetes endocrinology but this is a slightly complex because you have to start centrifuging patients blood at the bedside so it's not widely used but then we come on to oxygen. Now, for many years in the United States, still, there are numerous hyperbaric oxygen uh, tanks, if you like, or centers. And these are for treatment of complex foot ulcers. The evidence for their use is very poor. And indeed, the last three studies for hyperbaric oxygen have been negative, 
including a randomized study from the Netherlands published in Diabetes Care, I think in 2019. But then we're beginning to see studies with topical oxygen. And this is topical wound oxygen therapy, TWO2 or 222. This is a multinational, multi-center, apologies for the spelling, it's in diabetes care, which is the highest impact factor diabetes journal, clinical diabetes journal in the world, randomized double blind placebo controlled trial. And this follows <coughs> our guidelines of how to do randomized controlled trials. So this study was done according to the guidelines with all the necessary randomization control, proper inclusion, exclusion, and taking care of confounding variables. The primary outcome at 12 weeks showed that this topical oxygen, the uh, treatment group, 42% were healed versus 14% of those on standard of care, which is a huge difference. But not only that, the healing lasted and after 12 months, still the majority of those who had received topical oxygen were still healed compared with only a quarter uh, of those who had standard of care. Sham means they had the boot put on, but topical air, not topical oxygen. Here's the actual uh, study, these kind of ulcers. There's the paper, uh, and this is showing you the topical oxygen. It can be used at home uh, 90 minutes a day for five days a week or so. Uh, there's no proof that you need 90 minutes. You might need you know, a, a bit longer for three days a week, we don't know. But this worked. This is what was used in that trial. And the Kaplan-Meier curve shows you the huge difference between the active and the placebo control group. In fact, so convincing with these data that the uh, oversight committee at a, a priori pre-planned uh, assessment said this is such a difference, we don't need any more patients included, because it would be unethical not to offer them uh, topical oxygen. Now, in America, the Food and Drug Administration want excellent RCTs, such as this one, but they also want what we call real-world evidence. And this is a real-world evidence uh, published in Advances in Wound Care, uh, published in uh, two years after that study, and this is by Yellen and colleagues, and this showed reduced hospitalization and amputations in patients with diabetic foot ulcers. This was in the VA system. That's the closest in the USA you can get to our health service, the Veterans Administration. <coughs> and you see the outcomes here. Now, these are unmatched. It's not proof, but it adds to the randomized control trial. But you can see here the big difference in outcomes uh, for hospitalizations and for amputations. There's an 88% reduce reduction in hospitalizations, so 71% reductions in amputations. There have also been a number of uh, meta-analyses which have confirmed, uh, all of them have shown superiority of topical oxygen uh, versus uh, standard of care. So here is the FDA cleared and CE mark for Europe. Sadly, we're no longer in Europe. That's a great sadness for me. I mean, being past president of European diabetes, I'm embarrassed by Brexit. And it's a disaster. If ever you're traveling in Europe, it's a disaster. We're aliens. Anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, the FDA had cleared this, and it seemed marked the treatment of acute and chronic wounds. And the, the best data so far are for diabetic foot ulcers. So it delivers the high pressure delivery of oxygen with greater tissue diffusion, which is critical for restoring normal wound metabolism. And it's, uh, it's an oxygen concentrator, and it's delivered through this boot, and the patient can sit at home uh, watching, as they might be doing now, Starmer versus uh, uh, Sunak in a debate, apparently, I'm told, in Hull. So Grimsby, I beg your pardon. It also provides non-contact cyclical compression, which helps in connecting, uh, correcting the underlying peripheral vascular disease and helps reducing edema. And it also provides humid humidification if that's needed. Uh, and that's a choice you can have, have it or not have it, which we know helps healthy granulation tissue. So that's the uh, device, and here it is at home. 90 minutes is the standard uh, for three days a week, and they can sit and do what they want uh, for 90 minutes and any time of the day. Now, you know, <coughs> the American Diabetes Association publishes every two or three years a compendium on diabetic foot and you can all download this free of charge. And this was one, and uh, David Armstrong and I co-chair 
uh, co-edit this. And they asked us to put one together on complex diabetic foot wounds, where's the evidence? Uh, and we got articles on hyperbaric, topical oxygen, Brian Game talking about uh, the three C patch from Mike Edmonds, about uh, the uh, Explorer study, superstructure sulfate. We talked about uh, the um, VAC therapy or negative pressure wound therapy, what's in the pipeline by Jeff Gertner, who's very good at that, and, and others, and then the rest of it, we're talking about the psychological aspects, how can, patients can be uh, helped to use this. What's the patient response to this and can they manage it at home? So you can download that. That was published in 2022 by going to PubMed or the ADA website. Now, each year, the American Diabetes Association puts out its standard of care and is published as a supplement to diabetes care every January. And you can access this free of charge again on ADA website or on PubMed. The one that was published in this, uh, January this year gave level A evidence, which is a high re recommendation for good RCTs and meta-analysis systemic reviews, et cetera. Um, they suggest that negative pressure wound therapy, especially for those wounds uh, which are hard to heal post-surgery. Biologics, certain biologics, the autologous fibrin and leukocyte patch, the 3P, 3C patch or leukocyte patch, and topical oxygen therapy. They did not recommend the use of, of hyperbaric oxygen which is still widely used because it's reimbursed in the States. Now, the, uh, as uh, Jane has already shown us, the uh, International Working Group of the W Foot put out their guidelines uh, last year, uh, at the meeting in The Hague in May last year, and they gave a recommendation uh, to topical oxygen as well, but also include hyperbaric as well. So let me end here with a quote from the Bible. I'm sure you all are familiar with the book of Ecclesiasticus, but verse 19 of chapter 18. Before you speak, learn. That's probably a good piece of advice, by the way. But before you fall ill, take care of your health. And that should be the take home message tonight. OK, we've got these very good new treatments that can help. But our aim should be to stop things behind that before they occur, including we can even stop diabetes now. We know that if we identify people with pre-diabetes, then a good lifestyle changes and exercise reduces 50% going on to get developed diabetes. So this that's primary, secondary, if you've got diabetes, stop the neuropathy by good control, et cetera, and so on. So before you fall ill, take care of your health. That would be uh, my farewell quotation of the evening. I've got many more because I'm the dropout of my family. My whole family is in English literature. Professors of English literature. I'm just a dropout in medicine, you see. So I'll leave it there and hope there's some discussion. I think that's my last slide. I've got some reserve slides if anybody's got any questions. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Andrew. That's <coughs> just that was uh, you know brilliant. It's I, I don't think you're a dropout at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, mind you, you do sound like you have a rather brainy family. So um, it's all <laughs> in the genes there. So uh, I mean, one of the things when we sort of think about innovation, you know, we need to think about prevention, but I mean, of course, top oxygen therapy sitting in that advanced wound care therapies sort of, you know, section of our toolkit, isn't it? And when it comes to innovation, how do we drive innovation? You know, how do we pick this up? How do we innovate like in our clinics? How, how do we go about doing that? I mean, it's obviously a lot of it's about evidence, but, you know, RCTs are quite difficult. How do we prove that these things can have an impact? We've got any thoughts? I think we've got, the, we've got the evidence from the RCTs, we've got the evidence from the real world data. But I think having people use this and report on their experience. For example, there's, a, there's an orthopedic surgeon who I know well in, in Hereford, who's done a number of cases with this, with excellent results. Not all, you wouldn't expect all, you know, 80% responding very well. And this adds to the package, if you like, because this has to go through NICE, mm who are obviously conscious of costs, et cetera. But I'm sure it will go through because the evidence is there, the trials are there, mm. but all these things take time. It has to go through whatever it's called now. The, what are they called? I can't remember what they're called now. You referred to them at the beginning, ICBs oh, or something. The, oh, the ICBs, yeah. The, the I'll just learn what it stands for and they'll change it, you see. Yeah. Basically, those to try and you know, sort of 
get products into the market. But I mean, there is there is always a you know there is always options when it comes to chronic disease when it comes to this end stage management that you know because the cost when you think about the cost of advanced wound care therapies and then you think about the cost attached to the patients you know their own health and well-being the, then of course the health economics you know the the nhs cost the nhs right this is where you know advanced wound care therapies although the cost seems high on its original outlay she sometimes can reduce the impact and the the, co the ongoing costs if we can get these wounds oh, absolutely. healed. Absolutely. And this is short-term expenditure for long-term savings. And politicians, as we know right now, don't like that. They like something to happen so they can get re-elected. And it's the same for ICBs and all these numerous bodies that now exist who sit and sort of go through all these data and try and find a problem with it so they don't have to fund it. So we need really to push this with advocates, experts, uh, and the data, they're all there. Yes, and to, just to, to you know, to raise awareness of it as being you know part of the toolkit for advanced wound care therapies. It's it's you know it's there is actually and one of the things I'm just trying to sort of screening the questions as they come up. So I seem like I'm darting between the screens. Um, it's we've had a question here. So with regards to, the, to screening, is the screening tool universal across the UK? Thinking particularly about remission post ulcerative calcification. Thank you. Is that screening tool? Are we thinking about the NICE screening? Is that? It's probably the Doppler they're thinking about with vascular calcification. I, mean, I, I co chaired the American Diabetes Association group that put together the comprehensive diabetes pudding exam that was published. And we did not suggest that everybody should have a, 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 a corporational in, index done as part of that because this takes time and it's done in primary care and they may not have the equipment. And also, it can give you a false negative you know it's perfectly normal but the vascular calcification means it isn't you know it may be actually lower than that so i think for the trained ear for me it's more interesting and more helpful to listen to the doppler waveform than to measure the abi so i think we need to be careful i mean the standard of screening is for neuropathy of course the loss of uh, uh, using monofilaments uh, 128 hearts tuning fork the vibrative Many people have a biasesiometer, and we've published and showed that that clearly predicts ulcers. So these are simple screening tools, none of which are expensive and none of which requires an external power source. And that's that you know, people say, oh, we must have nerve conductions. I said, yeah, if you want to waste 200 pounds, get one. It doesn't tell you anything. It tells you you've got neuropathy. It doesn't tell you it's due to diabetes. So I believe in simplicity. And Paul Brand said, Forget all these tests. The most important thing is every time you see someone with diabetes, take off the shoes and socks and look at the feet. He's right. Yeah, and I think we do. I do. I think we do. We, we do have standardised uh, screening yeah. in as much as we we are checking for neuropathy and ischemia. We're you know we are using monofilaments, or we should be using monofilaments yeah. wherever the screening is happening, or a, or the Ipswich Touch test if the, if That's monofilament isn't available. Um, and, Certainly cheap. Uh, Exactly. Well, yeah, assuming you've got fingers. And, yeah, um, right. Most of our nurses do, yeah. And, uh, and we, should be using, um, we should be using our eyes and our, you know, history taking to, to collate, you know, people's, people's potential risk and feeling for, feeling for foot pulses. If you can't palpate foot pulses using a Doppler, right. um, but if you haven't got a Doppler available, then, you know, if, if there is anything indicated in that, in that history or in that examination, then escalating it to a centre where there is a Doppler available. Um, so I think that you know that that should be fairly standard for annual foot screening um, across across the UK. Um, and that's in, agreed in by all, all, all organisations in the UK. Absolutely agreed. Yeah. And um, we've just got another question here. Do you find patient? Do you find good patient compliance with oxygen treatment? Well, the, the patients I've dealt with have managed it very well. I mean, they're much better than I am. I'm hopeless technically. I couldn't never do surgery. I couldn't tie a knot. So, you know, they're, they're coping with it. And the staff from the AOT go and help them at home. So people go and show them how to do it. And, you know, they can see it's getting better. And they sit there. They don't have to go to hospital or a hyperbaric chamber. They can <laughs> sit at home for 90 minutes, you know, reading the newspaper or the depression, if you like to call it that, uh, and do what they want, watch television, you know, whatever. Uh, and it's easily done. And they soon... I'd be surprised that patients, I'd be surprised that could manage it much better than I could, are actually coping very well. 
and the people from AOT are there to help. Have you, um, just because I, do you have a, a slide on the at-home model, Andrew? Have you got? That was the one I showed you. Oh, uh, so, yes, I, I'll, yes, I'll, I'll come back. that picture with the person in the, okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, let me just see. Here. And I, I, I mean, I could imagine that that you know certainly patients that I see would be very compliant with the with the treatment because it's you know it's in their own home. They as exactly, as, yeah. uh, as Professor Bolton says, you know they can be yeah, you know, the they could be on their laptop still working, or they could be on yeah, a telephone exactly. call, or they could you know they could be doing anything else. Um, and and you know that's that makes it very patient centered. They're not having to take time out of their day to come to a hospital or a healthcare facility in order to have this therapy this this therapy done. Yeah, you know they so can be multi by the patient it. at home. Yeah, exactly. And I think in terms of compliance, that has to that has to really be be high up there in terms of. And the US compliance. studies reported very similar. I mean, that there were no major problems with people, and these are large numbers. Yeah, um, they have support. They have a phone line. You know, if there's a yeah. problem, they can call. That's very important. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So one of the questions that's popped up, um, and I know that we've got Rob on the call as well. So I don't know, Rob, if you wanted to kind of come in on this one. Um, great. Um, is oxygen therapy only for diabetics? Did you sort of... Oh, it's not, no. Uh, there are studies in many other conditions. There are big studies going on. There are some studies already in venous ulcers, for example. Uh, and this is a, a growing area too. Uh, and it can be used with any dressing as long as it's permeable, the oxygen can get through. Yeah, so can't use a vac, that's the only thing. Specifically in the UK at the moment, we there is uh, an alternative dressing to the chamber you can use it on, like pressure sores, other types of wounds. But yeah. the evidence is in diabetes and in vascular, but essentially anywhere where there's a, uh, a wound on the lower limb, you can use oxygen therapy to treat it. And you don't need to remove the dressings either. Yeah. Just to answer a question that's coming up in the uh, in the Q and A panel, it's an adjunct therapy where you leave the dressings on, and there's no need. Like most why... dressings are permeable, not all, but most. You just check, and there's a list provided a of those list. that might not be useful to be used with. And I know Rob, we we were having discussions before that you you can put the um, patient's total contact cost in there as well. You can, yes. So as if it's gas permeable, you can do it, just leave the boot on. And that's where the compliance is driven up because it's convenient, you know, and it's quite simple for the patient to use. So yeah, it's it makes life a lot easier for the patient and any carer or supporters, you know, doing it in their, in their own home. So, and I mean, we've got um, someone who's asking, they've been in practice for 10 years, they've never seen this type of therapy. Um, is the MDT podiatrist or consultant or GP who prescribes them? Now, it is a new therapy, you know, relatively here in the UK. It's really beginning to just, it's just putting its feelers out, really, isn't it? And I know, Rob, you've seen this particular product grow. Um, who are you seeing it with mainly uh, using this? Is it coming from the MDT or is it coming from the consultant, the GP? I mean, it's more MDT is my understanding. It's sort of an advanced wound care therapy. Yeah. It's definitely driven by the MDT and it's the diabetologist, the podiatrist, vascular orthopaedic, uh, even plastics now are starting to refer it if they're part of the MDT team for, you know, for, from, from a lower limb perspective. It's, it's generally all driven that way. There is the beginnings of tissue viability as well, beginning to refer patients to start, especially with, you know, from a vascular perspective in the community. So, but it is generally driven by the MDT. That is better. It's better done that way because it enables to for the patient to be one hundred percent screened correctly to make sure that they'll be concordant and you know carry out the therapy and it's suitable to to be set up in the home as well. I mean, in the US, it's more widely used, obviously, because it was first introduced there, especially in the VA system. It's used quite widely, and it's mainly. Many podiatrists, I think, and surgeons and some diabetologists, but podiatrists are probably the lead there. We're getting a few, we're getting a few inquiries from patients. Yeah. So yeah. it's so I had one out into, just the, into other the day mainstream. And, and I think yeah, I think patients are starting to find it through through social media or right. through um, you know, through internet searches. And we're getting a few inquiries in the hospital from patients saying, yeah. Oh, how do we access this? Can we access, can we buy it? Can we, you know. So I think it, it, you know it will start to be more mainstream. It'll start to be driven by patient choice, right. and that's and that's obviously quite powerful. 
I think the approach to NICE has to be multifactorial. Uh, the evidence, uh, the evidence in the UK, the evidence for RCTs, the real world evidence, and also case series from hospitals in the UK, uh, plus the cost, of course, the, the health economics, which is being looked at right now, and there should be a paper out soon. So literally last week, that health economic paper was, was reviewed for the first time and it's going to be available next week. And to prove cost effectiveness, obviously it's in line with our mission to get, you know, to work towards NICE. And, uh, and there are a significant number of UK trusts now in the process of commissioning and planning and building business cases to, you know, for its approval. So it's, it's On the move. significantly. So, um, We've had a question here. What is the cost? Is there um, is there a set cost, Rob, to this particular product? Is it? There is a set cost. So there's, it's a, it's provided as a service provision. So in the home, uh, with the support of AOT and the team, it's two thousand six hundred a month for that for that package. And then there's a a, a lower cost model if it's done in our patients or as an inpatient. And it has to be remembered that many patients in the studies in the uh, United States, the real world, uh, there are fewer hospitalizations and hospitalizations are really expensive. And if it can reduce hospitalizations, then that's a huge saving. This all comes into the, uh, the, the actual paper, which is coming out by a health economist. Yeah, we've, we've 100% proven cost, of, cost saving within the year. Uh, and for example, in, in one particular business case, there of their three hundred patients that are in this that are in the, the business case, they're going to save eighteen hundred bed days. So it's it's okay. significant from a you know from a trust perspective in terms of patient flow, bed blocking. You know that's the beauty of them being at home. You know when when we talk about having it at home, I mean one of the things that's just come up here, and I, I think I've read this right from um, one of the, the audience. The practicalities, given the demographic of our patients, being able to do this five times a week at home would be a major stumbling block. But you just mentioned the package, the at-home package, Rob. So I guess the stumbling block would be the practicalities of the of supporting them. But actually, AOT provides that service in this cost. Yes. So in summary, a, cl a clinician <clears throat> has absolutely nothing to do with the setup and the management of the equipment at all. It is managed between AOT and the patient and the support, the family support. Uh, and only this morning, I was setting up for uh, for a, a gentleman in his home with his wife, and you know we're there generally on, on first install for about two hours, and we're in daily, weekly, regular contact with these patients, making sure that they're all okay. So, and because it goes over dressings, you don't need to, you know, no district nurse has to attend at all. So we, we deal with it, 100%. I just see we're nearly out of time, but I see a few questions came up saying, can they all panel, all the attendees have copies of the papers, such as the um, the, the uh, ADA one, the compendium, and also the Bob Freiberg's paper in the real world? I'm sure you'd be able to arrange that, wouldn't somebody? Yeah, certainly we can put that um, in, you know, when our socials and we promote this, we can put that in the link and... Rob, if you've got access to those papers right right now, because you're sort of quick fingered, aren't you, in getting these things up on the screen? They look like maybe you can just put them up in the chat. Um, if not, they'll definitely be made available afterwards. So not not so worry. I've um, just posted the diabetes care one uh, okay. in Lovely. into uh, into the chat. So I'll just do it again quickly now. Lovely. And just on average, how often, how long do people have to remain on this therapy? It's, two months, it's, three it's months. difficult to say for the average. I mean, it was a 12 week study that showed those differences in the US. But you know, some people with larger wounds take longer. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. it, it, it all depends. You can't give an average because it's so, they're so different. The wounds, some are more neuro ischemic, some are, you know, neuropathic that was resolved for some reason or another. So it's very difficult to give a, a, the answer to that question. Okay. The key thing okay. is they remain healed after a year. So it's, well, it's easy to heal an ulcer, it's difficult to keep it healed. So this seems to work for that as well. Yeah, so just another question, the wound debridement, where does that happen? Uh, you would still need to see your patient, what they're saying is the oxygen therapy is an adjunct therapy, it so it's adjunct. extra. 
So you'd still yeah. manage your patient with the debridement, the cleansing, the offloading, yeah, right. but then you would have this oxygen therapy as extra. So I hope that answers that question there. And, you know, in the essence of time and trying to be a good chair and keeping to time here, um, and I have the sunshine coming through my window too, Andrew. So it looks like we're sunny down in the south as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just going to ask Jane, because I know we were just going to try to wrap this up, Jane, from, um, and I've got another set of slides, I think. For you, yeah, I was just I was just going to wrap up with um, with one just to say thank you. I mean, that was a fa fantastic presentation about um, uh, about uh, diabetic foot ulceration and um, oxygen therapy and, and great discussion and, and lots of really great questions, which I hope we've managed to answer. Um, so I just wanted to say from a diabetes, uh, a foot and diabetes UK point of view, you know, these are some of the things that we can do for you. And, you know, we will obviously share some of this, these resources around topical <coughs> oxygen therapy and adjunct therapy. We, you know, we get involved in, in publications and the big one at the moment for us is, is around um, reducing delays and uh, getting people to specialist treatment. And, and certainly, you know, the work of Legs Matter the work of um, you know this this adjunct therapy work is is really important in in sitting within that getting people to specialist care when they need it. Um, if we can just go to the next slide, um, uh, Joe, please. And then for anyone who wants to know any more about um, FDUK and what it will do for you, well, you you know you can join FDUK. It's a it's a free organisation. You can you can link with it like you can with Legs Matter, and you you know you can um, sort of be, be part of the membership of uh, of FDUK. You just look on the website and the website is on the next page. Uh, Joe, if you um, can show that for us. Lovely. And that's the website for you. If you if you click onto that, all the resources are there. You can find the, the link that um, is for the membership. And we'd encourage you and welcome you warmly. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll by all means um, share all of this information there. Thank you, Joe. That's great. Lovely. Thank you. Well, the sun is really coming through my window. Yeah. <laughs> I can barely see anybody on yes. the screen. I'm not complaining, no, it can stay. Um, Sunshine's but... on the right, Tris. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, look, it's um, it's been it's been a lovely evening this evening. It's been you know delightful, to, you know, discussing um, oxygen therapy with both of you, uh, Jane and Andrew. Um, thank you, Rob, for chipping in and helping with some of our uh, extra questions. Um, so this webinar has been around focusing on oxygen therapy and its management to support patient uh, and improve patient outcomes. That's where we've, what we've been doing. And this is all around trying to raise awareness on the hidden harm crisis of leg and foot care. Andrew did a fantastic presentation, you know, showing you the prevalence of diabetic foot disease, the mortality rate. And what we really need to be doing to think about reducing this impact is actually prevention in the first case. But when it gets to these points where things are chronic, and things are beginning to look at, you know, end stage, how can we start to use advanced wound care therapies to support our practice? And I hope that you feel that we've answered some of those questions around topical oxygen therapy this evening. If you have any other questions, put them in the chat quickly. Um, yeah. Otherwise, contact us at Legs Matter. Um, thank you, Jane from FTDK. Thank you, Professor Andrew Bolton, sitting in Manchester, and, uh, you know, wish everybody well.